All right, testing, testing, testing. One, two, three. Uh, hello, friends. My name is Lucas Mann, and I'm one of the pastors at Poplar Springs Baptist Church here in Ware Shoals, just a few few miles outside of town. And myself and uh, one of the other pastors of the church, uh, Brother Travis and his son Judah, come out here this afternoon to share with you the good news of Jesus Christ, to share with you the gospel of the glorious Son of God. We, we come to proclaim to you the message of life. My friends, we know, we know this from the Bible. The Bible says that those who have sinned against God abide in death. Uh, we know that all mankind suffers because of the fact that one man, through his actions, one man through his sin, caused death to, to be passed upon all mankind, to be brought upon all mankind. In fact, Scripture says that we are dead in sin. The Bible says that we are decaying away. Uh, scripture describes those who, who live in sin, who live in a life of unrighteousness, as abiding in death. But my friends, we know that Jesus Christ is the light of the world, that He is the life, that He Himself is life, that He Himself is life-giving, and that no one comes to the Father, no one has access to God outside of Jesus Christ. And so we come today with confidence in the message that we preach, the message that we are seeking to proclaim to you, that Christ is Lord, that Jesus Christ saves sinners, that He saves those who do abide in death, who do abide in iniquity, and who do abide in sin. And my friends, we come out here not out of hatred for you, but out of love for you, because we care for your soul. The Bible says that there is a there is value to the soul of man. Scripture describes, uh, uh, Jesus puts it this way, I should say, in the Gospels. He says, uh, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet loses his soul? And Jesus says that because your soul is valuable. And it ought to be your concern to preserve it, to save it, and not to throw it away for worldly pleasures. Many of you, unfortunately, live lives of sin, you walk in darkness, to use a term that uh, the Apostle John uses in 1 John. You walk in iniquity. And my friends, you need to be saved from such. You need to be saved from your pornography. You need to be saved from your drunkenness. Things that I once lived in. And my friends, I'm here to say that Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, saves from those sin. He saves from those sins. But you know what's beautiful is not only does He save from the power of sin in the life of the Christian, in the life of the believer, not only does Jesus Christ free us from being slaves to sin, but He also frees us from the punishment that we deserve for our sins. In fact, that's really what's in view when the Bible speaks of salvation. When the Bible speaks, uh, speaks about being saved, that's what it's referencing, is being saved from the judgment of God. See, there's an urgency to what I'm saying here today because I know that many of you, in fact, all of us, will one day stand before God. We will give an accounting of our lives to our Creator. And that's a fearful thing. The Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But I also know that you can have confidence to stand before God, the holy God of glory, because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In fact, that's what I want to look at this, this afternoon or this morning, excuse me, is that there is righteousness available for unrighteous people. There is salvation available for those who cannot get it in and of themselves, and it's found in Jesus Christ. It's found in the Redeemer. There is no other hope but in Christ. That's why Jesus exclusively claims to be the way. He doesn't say there's many paths to God and if your intention's right, you'll make it there. He says, no, I'm exclusive. My salvation is exclusive. And you say, well, I don't believe in any, any religious system. I'm, I'm atheist or I'm agnostic. I, I don't really care about those things. And you want to claim a, a, maybe a measure of neutrality. But my friends, there is no neutrality with Jesus Christ. He said, you are either for me or you're against me. And that's true, you're either under the Lordship, or I should say submitting to the Lordship of Christ, or you are 
submitting rather to your sin. In fact, Jesus describes it as everyone who sins is the slave of sin, but if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so my, I myself and my brother out here with me, we rejoice knowing that that is true and it's been true for us. See, I don't speak about these things merely from the objective standard of God's Word, which is sufficient, but I can also add to it my own personal experience that these things are true. That Christ does save sinners, for I am a great sinner. I am the chieftain of sinners. And yet Christ has taken notice of me and has saved me to His own glory. By faith, not by works of the law, so that I might not boast, that I might not be prideful, but that I might ascribe to Him the glory that is due to His name because He has done it all by His power. God bless you, ma'am. Thank you. Because He's done it by His power. So the passage I would like to look at this morning is found in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 22, the Apostle Paul here is writing about the, the life of Abraham, who was perhaps one of the most famous... Uh, Old Testament figures. In fact, he was the, the first Jew, we could say. He was the man whom God had set apart to be the father of the nation of Israel. That nation of people that God set apart ultimately to bring about the birth of the Messiah into the world. And Paul writes this about Abraham in Romans. He says, Therefore, verse 22, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited, as those who believe in him who raised, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. That's the end of verse 24 there. And if I could give this a title, it would be Righteousness by Faith. Righteousness by Faith. And when we think about salvation, that is really the essence of salvation. That, that is what salvation is in its essence. That we believe God. We believe the promises of God as Abraham did, as it says in verse 22. And God credits, this, credits to our account a righteousness that is not our own. In fact, that article, that, that precious doctrine of salvation by faith, which is ultimately salvation by grace, is the, uh, the foundation stone of Christianity. It's the uniqueness of Christianity. The Christian religion isn't like other religions because all other religions in the world proclaim you must do this, you must do that. The biblical Christianity says it has already been done. The work has been completed by Christ and we must cast ourselves upon Him in faith. And the promise and the guarantee from God is that His righteousness, Christ's perfect obedience is credited to our account and God sees us as wrapped in His righteousness, as perfectly holy and just in His sight. That is the Gospel message. That salvation is by faith. Unfortunately, there are many who claim to be Christians but do not believe this. I, I even encountered a lady out here just recently who said that she was a Christian but she, that, that she was trusting in her own religious performance to bring her into heaven. She was trusting in her own righteous deeds to save her. And many religious systems will teach that. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that. Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, they teach that. That salvation is something you have to work for. That if you want righteousness with which to stand before God, if you want to be perfect in the sight of God, you've got to earn it. But the Bible says otherwise. Paul writes elsewhere in the book of Ephesians, he says, for it is by grace that you have been saved. Through faith. It is, it is God's grace given to sinners through faith. In fact, Scripture says it is impossible to please God outside of faith because faith in its very essence is looking outside of ourselves and looking to God as our salvation. In fact, the psalmist writes, the Lord is my salvation. The Lord exclusively. God is jealous for all the glory and salvation. God is jealous for all the fame and salvation. And so it is by grace. It is by God's unmerited favor received by faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the object of faith. He is the one in whom we are to place our faith so that we might be justified before God, and certainly we will 
If Christ is your hope, I can tell you, my friends, you have a great hope. You have a perfect hope because it is a perfect Redeemer. He Himself is the great Redeemer, the great I Am. And so we are to look to Him in faith that His righteousness might be imputed to us. Because we inherently are actually, we're, we're spiritually, you could say, uh, impoverished. We are, we are poor spiritually. And we do not have righteousness for ourselves to claim before God. In fact, we lack righteousness. We are uh, sinners, utterly, to the, to the uttermost. We are, we are vile and wretched, and we are unrighteous. We are the opposite of righteousness. And so God, if He were to look upon us outside of Christ, He would see filth and sin. Even the prophet Isaiah writes, all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. Even the good things we do are seen for what they really are, mixed with sinful intentions and sinful execution. And so from beginning to end, we are sinners and we have a great lacking. We're lacking greatly of this righteousness that we need, but it can be given to us if we trust in Christ alone. If you trust, my friends, in the Lord Jesus Christ, cast yourself upon His mercy. He will save you. He will forgive you as He has forgiven me. And Abraham, Paul holds up here as an example of that. A man who was renowned, a man who was known for being a righteous man in the sight of God. Why was he a righteous man? Was it because he worked for it? Was it because he earned it? Scripture says he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. As Paul says here in verse 22. So let's look at that. Let's look at this righteousness that is by faith. In verse 22, he writes, Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. The word credited there means to account, to, to count over. Uh, Abraham received something that was not his own, something that he did not own. And that's Jesus' righteousness. And when I reference Jesus' righteousness, what I mean by that is the life that Jesus lived before his death, that life of obedience, all those perfect righteous deeds in the sight of God. God said at the baptism of Jesus audibly from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. All of that righteousness, that's what Paul's talking about here, is given to the believer, is given to Abraham. Abraham is looked upon by God as having lived the life that Christ lived. Why? Because Christ was looked upon by God as having lived the life that Abraham lived. Do you see that? That's the exchange that happens in, in the Gospel Christ takes ownership of the sins of His people upon Calvary's cross, and they in turn take ownership of His righteousness and are therefore justified. That's a great gift. That's the mercy and the grace and the justice of God shown. And it happened to Abraham. For when he believed God, God gave to him the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You could say he gave it to him on credit. That is because Christ at this point had yet to come into the world and fulfill the law as he did. Yet God in forbearance, knowing Christ would come and do this, knowing that he had foreordained his coming, could therefore count and treat Abraham as righteous, as perfect, though in fact he was not, because Jesus one day would perform perfectly in his place. See, my friends, you inhabitants of where shoals, this must be your hope. This must be your hope. This must be your anchor of hope. Not in yourself, not in your righteous deeds, but in Christ's, in his perfect performance, that he lived a life of obedience, that he suffered the wrath for sinners upon the cross, that he rose from the dead three days later, that he is seated in heaven at the right hand of God. Oh, dear friends, and I say that because I care for you, turn, turn from your sin. Turn from your idolatry. Turn from your worship of sports. Turn from your drunkenness. Turn from your love of hypocrisy. Turn from your lukewarmness and come to the Son of God and He will be merciful. Jesus Christ is a merciful Redeemer. Christ is a merciful Lord. And the essence of coming to Christ is that you believe. That you believe in Him. That you cast yourself upon His mercy. That you trust in His imputed righteousness. 
that it is sufficient to save you. And then Paul highlights this in verse 23. He says, Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also. My friends, see the Old Testament Scriptures and the New Testament. They were written for our instruction, for our benefit, that you and I might glean truth from those precious writings, that we might be blessed from the inspired Word of God. When we read in the Old Testament in Genesis 15, 6, when it says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, we ought to look at that and realize that it is for us. It is for our benefit that we have that precious account of Abraham's conversion. Abraham's conversion to Christ. And we ought to follow in his footsteps. Be like Abraham, my friends. Believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household, as the Apostle said in Acts 16.31. Paul describes this earlier in the chapter in verse 4. He says, Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. The good news that we have here today, my friends, to give to you is that God is in the business of treating sinners as righteous. God is in the business of regarding sinners as holy. Not because He's unjust. Not because He casts His justice to the side, as it were. Not because He throws those things away and disregards them. But rather because at the cross of Calvary, He dealt with the sin of His people. He punished that sin in Christ. Though Christ himself was sinless. That's the beauty of the gospel, my friends. And you may be right now living your life pursuing pleasure, pursuing worldly lusts, thinking that the pornography will bring you lasting joy, but it won't and it doesn't. Thinking that the last sip of the alcoholic beverage will bring you the joy that you need, but it will not. And it will not save you. In fact, those things will bring you damnation. Those things will bring upon your head destruction. And you're running from your Creator. You're running from the God of glory. Because you are a sinner. Because you are wicked. How does Paul describe it? In the previous chapter, in chapter 3 of Romans. Look at, look at what he says. He's quoting the Old Testament when he says this. Verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That is the state of the wicked, and that is the state, unfortunately, that you abide in right now if you are outside of the Lord Jesus Christ's saving grace. Oh, but friends, there is hope. There is hope. As long as there is air in your lungs and blood pumping through your veins, there is hope for you. Do not think, do not be foolish as to think that you're too far gone, as it were. That you're too wicked to be saved. That you're too evil. I tell you, my friends, before I was saved, I lived a very ungodly life. And God mercifully dealt with me in spite of my sin. And He likewise will do the same for you. But you must come. You must humble yourselves. Many of you are, are rank with pride. You, you're swimming in a sea of pride. And you won't simply humble yourself before the, before the gracious hand of God and say, Oh God, be merciful to me, the sinner. You know, there's a, lot of church, there's a lot of talk in churches today about saying the sinner's prayer. You know, and they have a little prayer written out sometimes on the back of a gospel tract or a preacher will tell you the words to say. But you know what the Bible says the sinner's prayer is? God, have merciful to me, the sinner. That's the sinner's prayer. A prayer of humility. That's the prayer that you ought to pray today. 
Cry out to God. Cry out to Christ and He will save you. A scripture says in Acts 2.20, For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He will be saved. Because see, when we cry out to God and we hold Him to His Word, as it were, when we come to Him in faith, believing that what He says concerning Himself and ourselves and salvation is true, we are showing our supreme confidence in He Himself, in, in His character, in His, in His strength and His power, and in His ability to fulfill His Word. And therefore, His name is at stake in salvation, and He will see to it that His Word is fulfilled, that His Word comes to pass. See, this is prophetic. This, pa this passage of Scripture is prophetic in the sense that it will come to pass in the lives of all of God's people. They will turn from sin. They will turn to Him. My friends, please, I plead of you, I beg you, come to Christ before it is too late for you. 151,000 people die every day. That's just an estimate. I'm pretty sure the number is higher. I've, I've heard higher estimates. 151,000 people every day, every 24-hour period, go from this life and they step into the life which is to come. They step into eternity. And you very well could be one of those people. You could be numbered amongst those. What will you say when you stand before God? Will you be righteous enough? Will you be pure enough? I can tell you you won't. The most righteous, the most holy man before God is utterly destitute of what he needs. In fact, we're hopeless in and of ourselves. My friends, you need a righteousness that is absolutely perfect, that is utterly impeccable, and that is the righteousness of Christ that Abraham was clothed in and that God saw upon him so that God could regard him, God could treat him graciously. That's the beauty of the gospel. But going back to verse four, or 24, excuse me, as we were just reading, it says it was for our sake also to whom it will be credited, as I just mentioned. This will happen in all, the lives of all of God's people. As those who believe in Him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Not only has God inspired this precious word to be written, but He has even worked in, in history. We see it in the resurrection of Christ. God has vindicated Himself. He has shown that He is God. Miraculously raising Christ from the dead. Christ has shown that He is life. That death cannot hold Him. Death could not hold the Lord of glory. It's impossible for Him to be kept by its power. And we see that in His resurrection. He proves it in His being raised from the dead. And so we leave off there in verse 24 with the realization, with the truth that Jesus Christ is alive. I do not come to you today to plead with you to believe in religious truths that are old and antiquated, as it were, although these are old truths, these are the old paths. And I do not come to bring to, to you today a truth about a Lord who is, who is long passed away. But I come to proclaim a Christ, the Christ, who is alive, who is the living God, and as Scripture says, who sits at the right hand of the majesty on high, who sits in heaven right now and reigns and rules over creation. As He said in Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus Christ is King. Jesus Christ is King. Kingdoms come and kingdoms go. America has come. America will go. Presidents, administrations, they pass away. But the Word of our God, the Lord of glory, remains forever. His kingdom grows and expands. And my friends, you would do well to submit yourselves under His Lordship, to submit yourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Dear friends, I love you. If I hated you, I wouldn't come out here today. It's a little chilly. But I love you. I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to burn in the lake of fire. I don't want you to, to be tormented day and night for your sins. Christ died for sinners. Believe upon Him that you yourselves might be saved. That you might be freed from slavery to sin in this life. 
that you might have a changed life. You know, when the Bible says to be born again, when the Bible talks about being born again, the reason that, that that word or that phrase is used is because to be a Christian, to become a Christian, is a radical, life-changing event. You know, when you were born, it was pretty radical. It was pretty life-changing. You went from being inside your mother's womb to being outside, breathing air, crying and screaming. It was pretty radical when you were first born. And the Bible uses that same terminology to describe the second birth because it is a birth. It's a radical change, an instantaneous work of grace in the heart of a sinner that God does by His own power and to His own glory. Dear friends, please, we plead with you. We plead with you concerning your soul. There is hope if you are alive. If you can hear my voice, there is hope for you. I'm, I'm not saying that Jesus is going to give you an easy life. Jesus promised a hard life. Jesus said if you're going to follow Him, it's going to be a difficult life. You're going to lose friends. You're going to lose family members. You're going to have financial troubles. Jesus said there's going to be tribulation. The Bible talks about being persecuted for Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says if anyone desires to live godly in Christ Jesus, he will suffer persecution. It's not something that you might or might not experience. It is something you will experience. I'm not out here to say Jesus is, is there to take away all your heartache and troubles. And there to take away all your financial difficulties. Jesus is here. Jesus came into the world. Christ appeared to save souls. I cannot say that you'll have an easy life, but I can say if you are Christ, you will have a glorious life in heaven that will not end, that will never be corrupted because God Himself will keep you. And that is the hope. We do not live for this world. We do not seek satisfaction in this life. Rather, we live for the life which is to come. Christ's kingdom is not of this world and therefore we do not fight as if it was. Rather, we fight the spiritual battle, battle because that is where Christ's kingdom exists and it will continue to forevermore. Oh, dear friends, I plead with you. Come talk to us. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to help you in any way that we can concerning your soul. We want to tell you about our Lord. I invite you to, to visit our church. I'm one of the pastors at Poplar Springs Baptist Church, four miles down the road here, right outside of town. My co-pastor is here with me. We want to talk with you. We want to plead with you concerning your soul. If you have anything you want us to pray about, come, talk to us. We care for you. If we didn't, we wouldn't be out here. And I'll note even in verse 24 at the end when he says, Jesus our Lord. I mentioned this already, but the sovereignty of Christ is an absolute sovereignty. The word Lord is kurios. It's the, the sovereign one is what that term means. Christ is that. He is the sovereign one. And whether you admit it or not, whether you confess it or not, whether you realize it or not, Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. What you must do rather is simply acknowledge His Lordship and submit to it with joy and gladness. So I, I don't like when preachers say, make Jesus your Lord. Like, we can choose. He is your Lord. You sinners, He is your Lord. But you must submit. Bow the knee to Him. And He will graciously exalt you. And so that's what we've seen here in this passage. Dear friends, I cannot, strong, I cannot exhort you strongly enough. It is, a, it is a, a mercy of God. It is a great mercy of God that fire from heaven doesn't come down and destroy the town of Ware Shoals. It's a great mercy of God that God has not sent a destructive tornado or an earthquake or a deadly disease to ravage the city 
and to destroy and to obliterate everyone who lives here because of the sin that's committed in this place. It is, it is God's grace that holds back this, this wrath that is going to come. Do you know when Jesus returns, He is going to come to bring wrath? He came in His first advent to graciously save sinners, but in His second advent, He is going to bring wrath. He is going to bring wrath and judgment. And dear friends, Will you be able to stand on that day? Who can stand on the day of Christ's wrath? Who can stand on the day of Christ's return? Only those who have found refuge in Him. As the psalmist writes, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. All of us have this innate desire, this, this bent to pursue safety. When there's danger, we want to avoid it. And God has implanted within us that will to live, that will to be safe. My friends, let that God-given will to live and to be safe compel you to trust in Jesus Christ. For on the day of judgment, you will not be able to stand in your sin. You will not be able to stand in your sin. The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and are safe. The offer is given to you graciously, dear friends, today. But it will not always be offered to you. There is coming a time, and it's very soon, and for many of you, today could be the last day that you'll live, that there'll be air in your lungs. 151,000 uh, 151, people die every day. Today could be your last day. Oh, my friends, be found in Christ. Trust in Jesus, and He will save you from the wrath which is to come. Your conscience tells you. It informs you about your sin. It informs you about your life. And says, yes, you, you are a sinner. Yes, I am a sinner. What am I going to do? What am I going to do about this? Many people try to seek religious works to hide in. Try to say, well, I'm going to read my Bible and pray. I'm going to be a good Christian. That will save me. The Bible says our righteous deeds are like filthy rags before God. You need something better. You need something perfect. And dear friends, it's Christ alone. It's Christ's righteousness alone that will save you, that can save you. His atoning sacrifice upon the cross, that's the only thing that can pay for your sins, is the shed blood of the Redeemer, that Christ's life was demanded of Him so that sinners' lives might not be demanded of them. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And you who say you're Christians, many of you claim to be Christians. You say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but you live an ungodly life. You abuse drugs and alcohol and you watch pornography, but you think, hey, I'll delete my search history on Google Chrome or on Safari, and so God can't see it. My friends, God sees it. God takes notice of those things. God sees all the wicked things that are done in darkness. You're hypocrites. If you say you're a Christian but you walk in darkness, I'm not saying you have to be perfect, but if you walk in a life direction, if you walk in a lifestyle that is sinful, full of sin, then I can assure you you're not a Christian. You're a hypocrite. And you need to be saved from your hypocrisy. Jesus encountered hypocrites in His earthly ministry and He called them to repent. He pleaded with them that they turn from their hypocrisy. Don't blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ by saying you're a Christian, but you live as though He never gave a law to obey. You live as though He never gave commandments to obey. I was like that for seven years. I said I was a Christian, but I was a hypocrite and destined for destruction if God had not saved me in His mercy for my hypocrisy. I thought, oh yeah, I've been to church. I said the prayer. I even read my Bible every once in a while. But you know what? Also, I love pornography, and I loved being a drunkard. My friends, see, when Jesus saves you, He also saves you from being the slave of sin in this life and frees you from that. Oh, my friends, have freedom in Christ that you might not die in your sins. Don't die in your sins. I love you. Do not die in your sins. for your, for your You will lose your soul. You will lose your soul for your sin. It's not worth it. The pleasure lasts so short and then it's gone. And if there's any Christians within the shot of my voice, or any, within the sound of my voice, give God glory today, my friends, and rejoice, for Christ is Lord and King.
Yes, we've sinned and we deserve destruction. But God sent Christ, the Redeemer, to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. All who believe in Him are saved, forgiven of sin, and given that righteousness that Abraham was given, as this passage clearly says in Romans 4, that righteousness of Jesus Christ. And what's the end to it? The end is the glory of God. God does it to His glory. As Paul says in Romans 11, For from Him and, to, and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. And amen.